My name is Paul Michelle. I'm the lead pastor here at the River in Forsyth, Missouri. And we'd like to take this opportunity to give you just a glimpse of who we are and what we're about. At the River, we exist to inspire and enable people to become fully devoted followers of Jesus for real and for life. The Bible tells us in Matthew 22 that when pressed by a lawyer, Jesus said the most important aspect of life is to love God and love people with all you've got. In today's fast-paced culture of isolation and division, we passionately believe that a relationship with God and with people are both so worth fighting for. Jesus is our passion, our obsession, and our motivation. Because Christ gave His all on Calvary, we give our best every day. We believe the church should be a beautiful expression of its people. We have been gifted to give, wired for work, and saved to serve. We don't just go to church, we are the church. Jesus didn't leave his followers with a religion. He left them with a mission. And our mission is to spread this Jesus movement everywhere we go and to the ends of the earth. We are the light and the darkness. If you're looking for a place to belong, a place to grow, a place to serve, please join us every Sunday at 9 and 11 a.m. Help us to inspire and enable people to become fully devoted followers of Jesus for real and for life. good is that? Hey, before you have a seat, I just want to pray over our service today. I want to ask this before we get started here. Did, did anybody come expecting today? Expecting God to speak to you? Anybody in here? Expecting God to speak to us today? Um, man, I, I just want to pray before we get started. I love the words of that song. Man, we want to see salvation come. We want to hear rescue stories. And uh, I just believe that walls can fall when we, when we come expecting for God to do the unexpected. Amen. When we believe that he is a miracle worker and he can do all things, uh, I just truly believe that today. I want you to believe that today as well. So I want to pray for us as we get started. God, that's our prayer today is that, you, that, that we let you be God, that we get out of the way, God, that, we're, that, that we can let go of things that we need to let go of, God, that you will tear down walls if we let you. And that's our prayer today, that you will move in this place. God, you're so good. We love you so much. You're so faithful to us. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross, for salvation, and God, allowing us to see the incredible rescue stories that you continue to do every day of our lives. God, we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and we all say amen. Y'all can have a seat this morning. We're in, uh, in the middle of a series called Stand Firm, as, as Pastor Colin pointed out earlier. Anybody, anybody in this room, I want to start this way. 
Uh, anybody remember playing Pac-Man? Anybody remember Pac-Man? Okay, now, yeah, now I want to kind of, we got to kind of divide this out because I know I'm talking to a few generations here. How many played the original version of Pac-Man? Okay, now we're talking. How many played it at an arcade? Yeah, we're telling ourselves now. Here you go, one more, one more. How many played it at an arcade while on roller skates? Yeah, there's a few of us left. There's a few of us left. So if you don't know, if you don't know the concept and understand how big Pac-Man was when it first came out, if you don't know the concept, then the name of the game was this, that this is what it looked like, and the name of the game was to eat all the dots, right? And you're, you may be looking at that and going, that's a lot of dots, 250 to be exact, uh, uh, not that I counted, but the name of the game of Pac-Man was to eat all the dots. And when you ate all the dots, you, you made it to the next level. See, the problem was those guys in the middle, and I don't know if you remember the names of the guys in the middle, Inky, Blinky, Pinky, and anybody? Clyde. See, you didn't see that coming, did you? Some of y'all didn't play Pac-Man as much as you think you did. Inky, Blinky, Pinky, and, and, and Clyde. And they were the problem, though, because the whole time you were trying to eat the dots and clear the board and go to the next level, they were coming after you. And they never stopped coming after you, did they? They were always pursuing you. And if they caught you and if they touched you, Pac-Man would kind of spin around and make a sound and then he died. And if that happened three times, the game was over. And, uh, but here's the cool part. Here's the cool part. In the four corners of this game were something called power pellets. There was one in each corner, power pellets, and if you, if you ate a power pellet, then the ghosts would turn blue and they ran for their lives. Why? Because Pac-Man could now eat them. And so if you're tracking, in the normal flow of this game, the enemy could destroy you in the normal flow. But after eating a power pellet, you can now destroy what was trying to destroy you. Some of you are like, I came today and you're talking Pac-Man. I came to church today and you're talking Pac-Man. Some of you didn't know how spiritual Pac-Man was. Surprise, surprise. You don't know that one either. Um, <laughs> some of you will. I love doing that voice. I haven't done that in a while. Anyway. But wouldn't it be great? I thought about this. I thought about this, you know, the spirituality of Pac-Man. Wouldn't it be great if you and I in life had some sort of power pellet. Because I don't know about you, but sometimes in life, I feel like Pac-Man. I feel like I'm just trying to clear the board, right? I'm just trying to get things done. I'm just trying to go to the next level. And every day, I've got a squillion and one things to do, and there's not enough time to do all these things. Yet everybody, for everybody, maybe sometimes we feel like something's coming after you. Every, every time you turn around, there's Inky, Blinky, Pinky, and Clyde on your tail. And it almost feels like there's a spiritual war that we're in, doesn't it? If only, if only, if only there was some sort of power pellet so that we could take out the enemy that's trying to take us out. Am I right? But what if I told you today, what if I told you that we do have that power pellet? It's something called worship. Notice I called it worship. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't call it singing because sometimes I wonder, I'm just going to say this today, sometimes I wonder if our mouths may be moving but our hearts are perhaps pretending. You know what I'm saying? See, worship, worship is not a song. Worship is not a style of songs. Worship is a lifestyle. Worship is a matter of, of, of an overflowing of the heart and the soul. When we become so focused, so focused on who God is and what he has done for us and, and what God is even capable of, that it literally overflows from our souls. That's worship. And in doing so, it changes the way we think and it changes the way we feel. I feel so sure of this today that I wanted to share this with you today. If you're taking notes, you should be. If you're not, you should be. Um, worship enables us to destroy what the enemy intended to use to destroy us. Worship for you and I, it, it enables us to destroy what the enemy intended to use to destroy us. In week one of these series, we talked about the power of sin. 
And because of the power of sin, the enemy is able to to stand over us. The enemy is able to intimidate us. Because of the power of sin, the enemy thinks that they can overpower us, right? But because of Jesus, and when we worship him, we are able to stand over the enemy in victory. That's how powerful worship is. In week one of this series, we've, we've been, uh, we, were, we started hanging out with a guy named Gideon. And that's kind of the point of this whole series. Let's kind of look into Gideon's life and Gideon's story. Can we all agree that, that Gideon has come pretty far in the last few weeks? Because when we met Gideon, he was in a pit, right? He wasn't praying. He wasn't reading his Bible. He wasn't watching a podcast. We're not really sure that, you know, why God even chose Gideon, are we? Other than the fact of his amazing grace and his amazing goodness, we're not real sure why Gideon, God? Why did you pick Gideon in a pit? Because at first, Gideon kind of stumbled out of the gate, didn't he? His, his first few interactions with Jesus, Gideon wasn't real solid. And, and, and I think that we can relate to that as followers of Jesus ourselves. But as Gideon began walking with Jesus, he began, he began to grow. And then all Gideon did was take another step and another step and another step in following Jesus. And then last week, we read how Gideon began to walk toward the battle. This is the first time that any Israelite walked toward a battle in seven years. And so this took some faith, didn't it? But, of course, Gideon, he had 32,000 men with him, right? This was part of the story. If I, ha- if I was going to pick a fight with someone and I had 32,000 people behind me, I- I'm feeling pretty good. But then, but then God showed up and told Gideon, 30 t- 32,000 men, that's too many soldiers, Gideon. That's too many. And, and we read that, that God pruned away Remember that? He pruned away some of the soldiers. And then God said, you know what, Gideon? That's still too many soldiers. And he pruned away some more. And God left Gideon out of 32,000 soldiers. He left him with only 300. Now, wouldn't, wouldn't you think that in this moment, Gideon felt a little disoriented? That he felt like, you know, without direction, Do you think that maybe Gideon at this moment that God took him from 32,000 down to 300, that Gideon felt a little discouraged? And maybe Gideon at this point had some some doubt? I would. After all, didn't, didn't Gideon do exactly what God told him to do? Sure he did. Gideon didn't disobey God. Gideon clearly obeyed God and was walking with Jesus as Jesus was calling him. Yet he found himself at a place with less. That doesn't really make sense, does it? I mean, we read last week that Jesus wants more for us, right? He wants more for you and I. He wanted more for Gideon. So maybe Gideon was like, God, I can't help but feel a little disoriented here because I thought you said fight, God. And God, remember you? when I was in the pit, you called me a mighty warrior, didn't you? But then, God, you took all my men away. What what is a mighty warrior without his soldiers? And and God, I can't help but feel a little discouraged here. I'm I'm probably going to die when I go into this battle. And maybe Gideon felt like, God, God, I'm filled with doubt here. Why? Because I don't think I've got what it takes to pull this off. I think Gideon felt that way. And I think Gideon in this moment... Um, felt that way, and the only reason I even bring all of this up today is because I'd be willing to say that there are some people here today, and, and you can totally relate to Gideon. Maybe you, you too feel a little disoriented in life. Maybe you too feel, feel like a loss of direction in this moment. Maybe you too feel discouraged, and maybe you've got some doubt. Maybe you're fighting a battle, and you didn't even see the battle coming because you thought you were doing the right things, right? You thought you were, you were walking with God. You were doing the things that he told you to do. You thought things were going pretty well for you in life. But now you feel like you're holding less than you were holding before. I think we've all been there. Sometimes, if I'm being honest, I, I walk in here on a Sunday and I feel all three of those things. I feel a little disoriented. I feel, you know, loss of direction. I feel some discouragement. I feel some doubt. And, and that's where Gideon was 
in this moment as well. He made it to a place in life with less than what he expected to have. And then, and then in the book of Judges, which is where we're going to pick up today in this story, Judges chapter 7, verse 8, it says, the Bible says, the Midianite camp was in the valley just below Gideon. So that means that, that the time is near and, and the fight is almost here. And then in verse 9, it says, that night the Lord said. Now, we're going to say this, these next two words, we're going to say these together as a group of people on the count of one, two, three. He said, get up. Okay, that was okay, but, but this is what I want you to do. I, I want you to say it now like you, you're waking your child up for the seventh time to get up for school, and you're tired of saying it, and this is the last time you're going to say it. You're going to bring in a bucket of water this time. You're pulling the sheets off. You're throwing them outside. You're doing something. You're tired of saying it. Let's say it like that. One, two, three, get up. That's what I'm talking about. That's what God said to Gideon. That's what God said to Gideon. Gideon said, get, uh, God said, Gideon, get up. Now, I feel like, I feel like I, I'm going to let you in on something today, and this is kind of dangerous. Um, hopefully, you'll never hear me talk bad about my wife. Uh, I don't ever want to do that. She's the best thing that ever happened to me. I'm so blessed. She makes me better in so many ways. I couldn't imagine life without her. But, but, there's this one thing. There's this one thing that I do not understand. Only one. Only one thing I don't understand. So in order for my wife to get up in the morning, she's got like seven alarms set. I mean, I knew you wouldn't believe me, so I stole a picture from her phone. Okay, maybe there's five. Maybe there's five. I miscounted. It looks like seven to me. That looks like a lot. And so every morning I hear every one of these alarms. I'm probably going to pay for this dearly today. God help me, pray for me. But I don't, I don't want you, I didn't want you to think I was lying to you. But I've asked my wife, I said, honey, why? Why do you have seven alarms? She said, there's five. Why do you have five? She says, I want to make sure that I get up. And I said, just get up on the first one. But then as, as I was talking to her, I realized that I have a snooze button on my alarm. And I don't know about you, but I can hit that snooze button fast. Why? Because I don't want to get up. I want to sleep in some more. Some of us who struggle to sleep in here, we wish we had that problem, right? We're just up, right? Well, we, some, but, but, but I just, I hit that snooze button. And I wonder if today, if, if maybe when we're a little disoriented, if maybe when we're a little discouraged in life, if maybe we're carrying some of this doubt that we don't just stop sometimes and just, just want to lay down, just, just for a bit, just... God, I just, I just need a nap right now. And in that moment, all of a sudden, we feel like we're the victim and God's the bad guy. And all of a sudden, in those moments where we just want to lay down for a little while, we ask things like, God, why is this happening to me? God, what, what have I done to deserve this? I'm just following the way you've done. I'm just trying to do my best, God. This is all I know. And maybe Gideon felt like this too. But God looks at Gideon. And maybe Gideon's, Gideon's feeling a little bit sorry for himself and, and, and about losing all these men and only having 300. And God looks at him and says, Gideon, get up. Get up. You know, I, I, think, I think God is saying that to some of us today. He's saying, get up. Maybe you fell down. Get up. Maybe you're hurt, hurting a little, but get up. Maybe you got, you know, a little comfortable in the place that you chose to sit down and kind of take a nap in life. But God's saying, get up. Listen, I said, I said last week that failure isn't final. And falling down doesn't make you bad. It just confirms that you and I are human. But get up. Get up. We can always play the victim, can't we? But let's be reminded today that the victims never walk in victory. Too many people try to play the victim today. Get up. God told Gideon to get up. And, 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 and he's saying the same thing to you and I today. We've got two options. We've got two options. We can either say, yes, Lord, and get up, or we can hit the snooze button and stay asleep in life. But the more times we, we smack that snooze button, the longer we delay the blessing that God actually has for us. So I feel like somebody needs to hear this today. You've stayed down long enough. It's time for you to get up. Now, 
we've just gotten started here. I'm not sure why it's taking so long to get this far. I guess y'all are going to have to listen faster. So let's go. Uh, where are we at? Verse 9. I've got to keep moving here. What's the hold up here? That night the Lord said, get up. Go down into the Midianite camp, for I have given you victory over them. Now watch this. Watch this. God said, number one, get up. Number two, God said, go down to the enemy's camp. Why? Number three, because I've given you victory. So what's this? Last week in this story, maybe Gideon felt like he had victory. Why? Because he had 32,000 men behind him, but now he only has 300 men, and he's feeling a little less victorious, yet God is saying, get up, go down, I've given you victory. There's a message here for us. God Watch this. God said, Gideon, you don't, have, you don't have what you once had, but you still have me, and that's all you need. I feel like somebody needs to hear that today. You may not have what you once had, but you still have him, and he is all you need. So get up and keep walking because God never told you to stop walking, has he? Keep walking. There's tension in this room. You feel it? It's there. I feel it. Get up and keep moving. Then God says this in verse 10. But if you are afraid, pause. Do you think Gideon is afraid here? Yeah, I mean, I th think about it. Jesus, Jesus called Gideon a, a mighty warrior when he was in the pit. But in reality, Gideon has never fought a day in his life. Like you give Gideon a gun, he's like, what is this? I don't know, pointing it at himself. And you're like, dear Lord, just give me the gun. Like he wasn't a warrior yet, 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 yet. And I want you to notice that God didn't, didn't say to Gideon, hey, Gideon, if, if you're afraid, that's only because you're a coward. Remember where I found you, you know. Gideon, if, you know, you're an idiot. God didn't look at Gideon and go, I understand if you're afraid because you're kind of wimpy, Gideon. God didn't look at Gideon and say, after all, I found you in a pit. What do, you, what do I expect, right? I mean, Gideon. God didn't look at Gideon and say, Gideon, after all the things I've done for you, the fleece and, and the dew, Gideon, you were about to take a bunch of traitors into battle, Gideon, but I sorted all that out for you too. You're welcome, by the way. Gideon, I've done all of this, and you're going to doubt me? God didn't say that. He didn't say any of that. We're about to see that God met Gideon right where he was. God tells Gideon, hey, if you're afraid, Gideon, I'm with you. I'm always with you. But isn't that the grace of God? That's how the grace of God works. He meets us where we are, but he loves us too much to let us stay there. That's the grace of God. Verse 10 says, but... But if you are afraid to attack, Gideon, go down to the camp with your servant, Pura. Now, if you're looking for a baby name today, I got one for you. I, I can't say that your kid won't get picked on for being called Pura. But there you go. You're welcome. Pura. Seriously, though, I want, I want us to see that, that once again, God was there for Gideon. Just like he's there for you and I. Don't you, don't you love when God, when God takes us to the next step, when he, when he takes us to the next level, that place where, where God will also tell you who needs to go with you to the next thing? See, this is, this is kind of a weird strategy here because God looks at Gideon and says, Gideon, don't wake up all 300 soldiers. Just take one guy with you. Just take Pura with you. So why this guy? Why Pura? Remember, remember last week? We talked about pruning. Pruning is when God takes something from us and then he gives us something better. Remember that? So, so we look at this and we're like, what is so special about this guy? Pura, what is so special? In these times, I want you to see this, in the times we're reading about, the biblical times, names had meanings. Did you know that? Like today, we don't have much meaning into our names. We're like Bob. I like Bob. Why Bob? I don't know. Grandpa's name was Bob. I heard it in a movie. I uh, saw it, heard it in a song. Uh, Bob has three letters. You can spell it the same forward, backward. Let's go with Bob. Bob's great. But in the Bible, 
in, in the culture that we're reading about, biblical names had real meanings to them. So I did some research. Pura means one who bears fruit. You think that's a coincidence? I don't think so. God says to Gideon, he says, Gideon, take someone with you with some fruit. I don't know about you, but that's what I want in my life. I want people around me with some fruit. I don't want perfect people. We don't even have any perfect people around here. We send them to other churches. <laughs> if, if you're perfect, we won't even, we'll stop you at the front door. We won't even let you in. So I don't want perfect people around me. I want some people with some fruit, right? And Gideon wanted that. He wants that for us, and he wanted that for Gideon. God wants that for Gideon too. Verse 11 in this story says, Listen to what the Midianites are saying, and you will be greatly encouraged. Then you will be eager to attack. How about this strategy, right? God said, listen, listen to, to who? To the enemy. God said, listen to the bad guys. Like, what, what's this about? Growing up, I, I, I played sports, and um, I was a Branson Pirate, the old red and black attack. And my sons, I'm proud that my sons uh, uh, play, play for the red and black as well and play at Branson. Our biggest rival growing up was the Republic Tigers. My youngest son played them yesterday. And I realized as I, as I went back into Republic and saw all the orange and, and, the, and the white and the black, and I realized I still hate the color orange. Hi, my name is Paul, and I have issues. <laughs> so now, knowing all of that, let me ask you a question. What would happen if I was back in school, and I was in the football huddle, and we were playing Republic, the orange and white, and we're talking smack like we did when we got in the huddle, and we'd be like, let's kill them. Let's do it. Let's go break their knees. Let's do whatever, because they broke ours last year. So let's get them back. Let's smack them. Let's hit them hard. And we're in the huddle, and we're talking smack. And we look up. What would happen if we looked up, and there's a guy in our huddle wearing orange and black from Republic in our huddle? And he looks at us and says, hey, guys, I just wanted some encouragement, so I just thought I would step in here and get it from y'all. Y'all, we would tear him apart. We would drink his blood. We would... We, you walked over, you're going to limp back. Like, we're going to send him back where he came from, right? We're like, are you kidding me? This is our huddle. That's your huddle. So why would God send Gideon to the enemy camp to be encouraged? It's simple. God wanted Gideon to know, hey, Gideon, I know what you've lost, but I'm still in control. Hey, Gideon, I, I know you're a little discouraged. I know you feel a little disoriented. I know you have some doubt, but I'm still God, and I'm still powerful, and I've got all this. That I, I, think, I think God wanted Gideon to know, hey, I will use what was meant to destroy you to destroy them. I will take you to the next level in your walk with me if you'll let me. Verse 11 in this story says, uh, so Gideon took Purah. Isn't it crazy? Isn't it crazy this whole story, God said it and Gideon did it? The whole time, God says, here's what I want you to do. And Gideon's like, okay, God, here I go. I think today God is looking for people like that. People like Gideon that say, hey, really, God? Is this what you want me to do? I don't understand it, but God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going I'm I'm to walk in. I'm going to do what you tell me to do. Then in verse 11, of this story, it says, So Gideon took Purah and went down to the edge of the enemy camp. Now, what, this, this is where it gets good, y'all. The armies of the Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east had settled in the valley like a swarm of locusts. Their camels were like grains of sand on the seashore, too many to count. So they obviously must have smoked the unfiltered camels or something, cigarette butts everywhere. I, I, don't, I don't think that's what it meant. But anyway... <laughs> Too many to count. Gideon crept up just as, man was, just as a man was telling his companion about a dream. Now stop. Remember, this, 
this wasn't a Navy SEAL operation, right? This is, Gideon is clueless about this stuff. He's like, God, I don't know what you want me to do, but I'll do it. God, I don't know where I'm going, but I'll go there. He doesn't know what he is doing here. And he's creeping up on the enemy, and he's listening to a man telling his companion about a dream. And in verse 13, it says, the man said, I had this dream. And in my dream, a loaf of barley bread came tumbling down into the Midianite camp. It hit a tent, turned it over, and knocked it flat. Now, that's an interesting dream, isn't it? How, how many of us here today, would? how many own a gun? How many own at least one gun? That's right. This is all my Second Amendment people right here today. Maybe you're here you're like, and you're like, I believe in gun control. So do we. You break into our house, we will control your meeting with Jesus. We will introduce you to him personally. You shouldn't be in our house. You better be right with him because you're going to know him. So now I'm not going to ask where you keep your gun, uh, but, but most of us, you know, keep one by the bed. I don't have one by the bed. I have three. And so um, it's a good place to kind of keep a gun. But do you know, do you know what we don't have by our beds? A loaf of bread. Why? Because that would be weird. Right? Like we, I think we can all look at this and go, this is a weird dream. Anybody have weird dreams? I had a weird dream last night. This is weird. But would you also agree that God is able to speak through our dreams at the same time? Right? But this, this is a weird dream, I know. Like, think about it. None of us have bread in the safe at home, right? Like, none of us, if someone broke into our house and their intentions were harming us, none of us are going to look at our spouse and go, babe, quick, you grab the wheat, I'll grab the rye, and we just start chucking Hawaiian rolls at them or something, you know? None of us are going to do that, right? It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. So we look at this dream, and we're like, this dream doesn't, doesn't make sense. But I want you to see something. When you read the Old Testament, when you read the Old Testament, Jesus just appears in, in, in different places. He just, it's just like, it's just like you're reading along and then it's just like this. Jesus just pops up. You're just reading this story and you're like, what does this have to do with anything? Jesus is like, it's just weird. But, but Jesus, I want you to see this. This doesn't make any sense about the whole bread thing until we remember what Jesus said in the book of John chapter 6, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And we know that when the bread of life comes crashing into the enemy's camp, we are victorious, always. So here's Gideon creeping up to the enemy's camp. He's listening to this conversation. He's listening to this between two soldiers in battle. And, and verse 14 says, his companion answered, your dream can mean only one thing. God has given Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite, victory over Midian and all its allies. So at this point, I kind of see maybe Purah looking at Gideon. And Gideon's looking at Purah. And Purah's going, hear that? And Gideon's going, I, I don't know, man. There's a lot of Gideons in Israel. That's a common name. Every time I go to one of those gas stations, I look for those little license plates with Gideon on them, and, and the Gideon ones are always gone. I always want one, but I can't get one. They're all sold out. There's a lot of Gideons in Israel. So I don't know if he's really talking about me, but maybe Purah looked at Gideon, and Gideon's like, he's like, Gideon, yeah, but, but is he said Gideon, son of Joash. Isn't that your dad's name? And Gideon, maybe Gideon's like, yeah, I heard my dad my whole life. Get Joash over here. No, I'm just kidding. I'm <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Welcome to the river. Um, where are we? Where, where can we go from here? Um, maybe <laughs> every time you're going to look at the word Joash, you're going to think about that. You're like, Joash. Oh, that was fun. Okay. Where was I? So. Maybe Pur is looking at, at, at Gideon and going, that's you. Like, he's talking about you. But I wonder if Gideon in this moment is like, yeah, but, but, but I, don't, I just don't know. And maybe you and I, we, would, we look for signs from God and we pray for signs from God, right? 
But sometimes when we get the sign, we, we look to God to give us those, and we want God to make things clear for us. But when he makes them clear, it maybe freaks us out a little bit. And we're not sure how to respond. But I love how, I love how Gideon responds here in verse 15. It says, when Gideon heard the dream and his, its interpretation, he bowed in worship before the Lord. Did you see that? Gideon, Gideon was so moved that he worshiped God right there. I want you to see this. Gideon didn't hear the news and kind of hear the story and the conversation between the two of them going, that's me. Like, they're talking about me. God's going to give me victory. And then kind of mull it over on his walk back to his own camp. And then when he gets to camp, he, get, he maybe gets excited and, and wants to start a worship service. He's like, we need to get together and worship God for God. He's like, no, 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 no. The, the news stopped him in his tracks. And Gideon began worshiping God in the enemy's camp. How crazy is that? Could you do that? Could you worship in the enemy's camp? And listen, I'm not, I'm not taking anything away from our worship services here. We are so blessed. We have amazing musicians. We, we, uh, we plan things and we work on things and we pray about things. And we're very intentional about the songs we sing and the way we sing them and the, and the day we sing them on, the, that they line up with the message. And we're very intentional on all that. And, and, and you know, in, in our services, you'll know that our worship is loud. It's going to be loud. There's a couple reasons for that. Number one, to prepare us for heaven. If you read the book of Revelation, heaven's going to be loud. It's hilarious when people go, I don't like big crowds. You're going to hate heaven. I don't, I just, the music, I mean, I, you're going to hate heaven. Number two, we want to, number one, we want to prepare, for, prepare you for heaven. That's why we're loud. Number two, when it's loud, you don't hear yourself sing. Some of you are like, I, <laughs> some of you are like, I like hearing myself sing. You might be the only one that does, Okay. So we play the music loud. We sing loud in this church. If you're being honest, when you're at home and you're listening to worship and you're singing in the shower, does anybody whisper in the shower? No, we sing loud in the shower. We don't care. We sing loud here. But let's, let's, not, let's, not, let's not think about how we do it here because Gideon didn't have a worship service like this. Gideon worshiped in the enemy's camp. Can you? Can you worship at work? Can you worship in the license bureau? Can you worship waiting in line and at, in Walmart where everybody's grumpy because they got to check themselves out? Can you worship there? Can you worship while you're waiting, while you're waiting to hear news from the doctor that you're not looking forward to because you don't think it's going to be good? Can you worship there? Can you worship in a situation when you know that the situation is probably not going to turn out well? Can you worship there? Can you worship when you're lonely? Can you worship when you're frustrated? Can you worship when you're scared? Can you worship when you're tempted? Can you worship in the enemy's camp? Because worship is power. It's a power that we need when we need it. Sometimes you, you may need to get up from your desk or walk out of that warehouse and you just may need to walk around and worship. Put some AirPods in and worship. Everybody else taking a smoke break, you take a worship break. There are moments in your life maybe where you're like, God, I'm upset. God, I feel like I'm in the enemy's camp. Can you worship there? Can you get to a place where you're like, God, I know this sucks, but God, you are faithful, and I'm going to trust you because you deliver me. Gideon was able to worship. And check this out. Remember, remember the first two words that we started with? that I kind of challenged you on and we said together, the first two words that God said to Gideon in, this, in today's story, he told Gideon what? Get up. And now, now God is telling him, Gideon, I'm going to give you victory. Gideon followed God. Gideon trusted God. Gideon listened to God, even when it was hard, even when it didn't make sense. And then he bowed in worship to God. Now watch how worship changed Gideon, in verse 15, the Bible says, Then he returned to the Israelite camp and shouted, Get up. 
for the Lord has given you victory over the Midianite hordes. Did you catch that? Gideon shared with these men the same message that God gave him. God said, get up. Gideon told his men to get up. God said, I've given you victory. Gideon said, he's given us victory. Why? Because his heart and his mind had been transformed by the power and by the response of his worship. And when we worship, we start thinking like God thinks. And we start speaking like God speaks. Gideon says, get up. We have victory. My dad, my dad, uh, always, I always grew up in church and, and my dad always had a guitar. He played at church. He played at home. My dad was always playing and I, I look back at, with some regret that I didn't pick up the guitar uh, a little earlier but one day I picked up the guitar and I just started learning some chords and, and, uh, and so I picked it up. And then as I learned the chords, I just began to worship with the guitar and singing out. And I, I, I realized that it, my ability in, 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 in the worship never meant as much as it did a few years ago when this thing came on our world and kind of we had some questions and we had some doubts and we had some uncertainty and we had some fear and everybody kind of locked down in their homes. And I remember those times. I, I would come here because nobody was here. And I would go out in that lobby and that lobby has amazing acoustics and it just echoes out there. And I just remember singing out and worshiping. And I still wanted to stay in touch with some people, you know, some of our church people. So I put some videos out there of me singing and playing and worshiping. And it was just, I just had such an amazing experience when I was out there. And as I sang, I sang louder and I played louder and I worshiped all by myself. And I felt like every time I worshiped, the, the, all the uncertainty, all the fear, all the doubt just went away. And I, I remember singing a song that kind of came out at that time, and it goes, It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Oh, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. And I would just sing it out and let it echo in that room. I wonder if today you and I can sing that song as well and worship him in this song. You want to try it? Let's sing out today. Would you stand with us?